100 percent. Red and blue, purple like Prince. Red and blue, purple the Benz. Change up the circle of friends. The nether will circle the twins. 75 ever since. 70 wives in the fence. Red and blue, purple like Prince. Red and blue, purple like Prince. Red and blue, purple like Prince. Hi, right, it's uh, Christopher and Wendell sitting here with uh, one half of the pillars, Blue Pill. What's going on, brother? How you doing? Thanks. First and foremost, thanks for taking the time to do this with me, man. Um, just to get the people introduction, uh, this is a project I put together. Uh, out of nowhere, one day I had the inspiration to do a 40-day fast. I went um, 20 days with no food, straight water. And then after that, I was straight vegan, uh, no sex, no jacking off, no smoking, no drugs, anything like that. But... um. During the fast or whatever, I thought about the process of self-deification. And in the process of self-deification, I've always had a Christ-like energy. My name is Chris. Uh, I was born on March 3rd, 33. You know, the crucifixion mm -hmm. of Gotha. A whole bunch of stuff like that. And then... um, How old are you? I'm 27 now. About okay, to be so 28. You so. ain't hit your 33rd. Nah. Your 33rd. But uh, completion of the heart chakra. I'm learning a lot about Lucifer. Um, a lot of things we saw today in the um, lecture spoke to me as well. But uh, the name of this project is 40 Days Faster for Harvard. And you see the fours in that. And I you know, wasn't even thinking about that initially, but started following some of your work. And I saw a correspondence. And then, um, you know, ironically, coming over here, you see the 44 on Nostrum passing me. So just a whole bunch of 44s, you know. But uh, getting back to the messianistic aspect of it or whatever, uh, I'm putting together a project for Harvard to show the importance of having a messiah in the collective psychology and what it does for the culture. And basically just want to take some time. Uh, I know you and your brother are something to study uh, in depth, ask you some questions, maybe get some insight, and mm -hmm. like to present to the people, uh, Harvard, you know, show what my mind is and what I'm thinking about, but most importantly, document my growth and where I'm at at this point, my mythology and uh, my life. Because, you know, as we know, we're all living out mythology, and I'm living out this Christ-like energy. So I ask you these questions, like I said, for insight, but also for a better understanding of myself. So uh, going straight into the first question, uh, I've often seen you use Black Law's dictionary to discern between legalese and contemporary connotations with discerning the spells of words that have been casting over the minds of masses. Uh, in its essence, what do you think a Messiah is and uh, how you've seen it portrayed? Do you think that's accurate or do you think we haven't seen it portrayed to be something it isn't? You know, just elaborate on that. Well, it's interesting that when we talk about law, you know, a lot of it falls under the diction of Ecclesiastic law, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So law within itself has religious connotations. And then they tell you that church and state are separate. Mm -hmm. But yet and still, rule of law is what rules the land. But they're supposed to be a Christian country. Right, right. So at what point does one differentiate, you know, the commandments of their religion, okay, mm -hmm. between the quote-unquote laws of the land? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? At what point do they switch gears? Because if it's a Christian country, then the laws of the land should be Christian as well. Right. But the laws of the land are not Christian. Mm -hmm. But you have to abide by the laws of the land and put the country or the laws of the land before your God. Right. You know what I'm saying? So we live in a very twisted reality. Um, and this reality, as my, my brother Buddha Klink always says, is one that is conducted or falls under what he calls the Jesus crisis Jesus Christ's narrative mm -hmm. so we live in a society that's permeated by the story of Christ we live in an entire society that is structured around a narrative a fictional narrative mm -hmm. quote unquote that has um, uh, 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 real life emanations as you said because you can find yourself in this story and that's the point of a story. Right. That's the point of a mythos. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So we can all say, all right, we live in a Jesus crisis narrative, but we also live in a sorry and tell. And this is something that's repetitive. Of course, we see it in all of, you know, we see it in all of the movies. We see it in all of the narrative and stories or what have you. So when we look at the idea, the concept of, a messiah or a messianic force um and of course through our studies we see again that this again is something that transcends just christianity this is something this has always been here mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying 
So I think that um, we're just living within the latest version of it. And based on the dictates of the fact that it's the narrative, it's the code that controls this particular, uh, what they call this age, mm -hmm. you know, from the Piscean to the Aquarian, that we're experiencing it the way that we experience it, you know, and I'm able to see it and identify it in a lot of its different permeations in society. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, keeping that concept going, uh, noticing, you know, going from the Piscean to Aquarian age. One thing I noticed recently was uh, with the burning of the Kaepernick jersey, I interpret that as the burning of the Red Seven or the start of the Kundalini rising at the root chakra. You know, he was in California, San Francisco. And uh, based on that situation, I noticed the fear of a black messiah, which prompted this project because you know, you saw how the news covered everybody. Said, oh, why is he doing this? And to me, I was like, yo, at least he's standing up for what he's believing. You don't see too many entertainers or athletes do that anymore. So what is it that you... Um, you go ahead. Kaepernick is a very interesting character. And this goes directly into the Law 44. You know, we have to understand that Kaepernick experienced a meteoric rise um, the year that he ascended, you know, to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. And... He is a Scorpio, you know what I'm saying? When I did the gematria on his name, his name came up to Sacrificial Fowl hmm. and also the Prince of Peace. Mm -hmm. So he had messianic energy on him. And not only that, what he had done to actually get into the position that he was in is he had to defeat Mike Vick's record. Mm -hmm. So you have Mike Vick, who was the prototypical uh, messianic figure because of the fact that, you know, mm -hmm. this brother had went from the uh, the Falcons or what was the first team? He was on it the, was the Atlanta. Falcons and then yeah, he went then to he the went Eagles. To the, he, yeah, from the Falcons to the Eagles. Right. And he kept that seven energy on him. He was crucified in public, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, for dealing with the Ampu energy. Mm -hmm. And, of course, like I, like you said earlier, you know, we, we, we saw through the lecture how all of these themes are repetitive and what have you. So he embodied that and, and took that energy over and he became the falcon to spread his wings mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying and it, you know he did it of course all through the 44s because if people our sports buffs that understand that they could do some research and look at the stats they will see the 244 yards and i, I researched his, his his entire history and he's just 44 oh he's 44 now you right. know what i'm saying and especially that particular um, ascension, that meteoric rise that year when he took his team to the Super Bowl, he was going against Ray Lewis, mm -hmm. who wore the number 52, mm -hmm. okay, who also embodied God energy. So you had one person, Ray Lewis, who was all about God, right? and you had Kaepernick, who was under fire because of his tattoos, but he was strongly about, look, I'm a man of God, you know what I'm saying? I'm doing this for God. This is all about God's work, this, that, and the other. So this is how they was playing this out in the media. And then they had, this was the um, the horrible bowl, um, bowl, two brothers. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Again, going back into the mythos, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? Like the Abel and Cain type deal almost, could you say? Like the Abel and Cain or the saw and set aspect mm -hmm. of things. So there was so many themes in this particular Super Bowl that spoke to the religiosity of this entire, you know, play mm -hmm. or the, the way that these energies were playing out. And when we go and we talk about the fear of a black and more Messiah and we speak about it being a campaign that has been continuous since Christian Dome went to war with Islam back in Spain, we understand that we can look at the Baltimore Baltimore Ravens, right? The black birds from Baltimore, from Mary's land. And we could say, okay, well, those are the Moors. And then we're looking at San Francisco 49ers, right? And we're looking at San Francisco. We understand that those are the friars. Mm -hmm. That's the church. That's Rome. Mm -hmm. So we still see this continuous battle between the Moors and the church of Rome. You know what I'm saying? Taking place. And then the saints came marching in. So they played it. In mm -hmm. New Orleans, right. you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And at 1322, the stadium went black. Yep. They had the blackout on the 44s. And this is the year that Beyonce did her thing when she brought out her alter ego, mm -hmm. right? Emanating the Jupiter and Gemini energy when she had on the black and white and she was twinning herself. Mm -hmm. So all of these things are permeating and I'm looking at them. And then, you know, uh, of course, uh, 
uh, the Ravens won that particular game, mm -hmm. you know, and it was somewhat prophesized. Mercedes Benz had a, a ad because it was in the Mercedes, uh, the Super Bowl, the Mercedes Super Dome. Mercedes yeah, Dome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they had, you know, they said, watch out, it's going to be a fiery fourth quarter. So the brother had a meteoric rise. Even in that game, he almost brought his team back. Mm -hmm. And he came back after the second half, after the blackout. Mm -hmm. And he blacked out, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. But he didn't quite make it, you know, and immediately after – they lost, okay? Immediately after San Francisco lost, the Pope resigns, hmm. okay? Unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. And he said what? He said, I had a, a, a dream, a mysterious vision from God. Mm -hmm. And he told us to step down. So then we get the Jesuit Pope that came after Pope Francis, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. And then they set up what? The Super Bowl to be played the 50th, mm -hmm. the grand finale or the grand gathering to be played in San Francisco. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I'm sitting back and I'm watching all of these things and I'm like, okay, so for Kaepernick to come out after all of this ritual has taken place, all of this has been charged and permeated. Now he is ascending, right? Mm -hmm. Like I said, during the 50th, when they brought, they brought this a uh, uh, Black Panther, right? The return of the Black Panthers now. I already told you about the Baltimore energy. So the return of the Black Panthers comes to San Francisco to play this game. And now this quarterback is a Black Panther. They got the Afro right, right. fist up. He's wearing a Fred Hampton shit on December 4th. They're playing in Chicago. Like all of this. So we have to beg and ask the question because it's either one or two answers. Either this is scripted and they're forcing Right. Mm -hmm. This whole aspect of religion playing itself out in society or we're watching a dead letter religion actually come to life mm. through a mythos of these people playing as actors. So what you're saying, yes, it might have, you know, th those connotations might be accurate in regards to saying this might be the burning of the, the seven ritual and the red and the Kundalini. Mm -hmm. But Kaepernick is definitely a Christos archetype. Hmm. Hands down, you know what I'm saying. Even with the, the the look at his nose, he has a he has a he has it looks like a hawk. Mm -hmm. He has a hooked nose, you know what I'm saying. He's a hey roof figure. Yeah, you feel me? He's a hey roof figure, but he went from a Christ to a, a antichrist in their world. Right. You know what I'm saying? Or demiurge in their world. Mm -hmm. He switched sides, you know. But these things come about when one loses. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's so many other elements to it that right, right. weaves the story together that makes it crystal clear. I'm giving you a whole lot of 44 no, cloth no talk. Doubt. No doubt. You know what I'm saying? I was saving this for my uh, <laughs> my next to bridge version of it. But nonetheless, yeah, um, I, I think that that's kind of accurate if we're able to look at things as archetypes mm -hmm. if we're able to appreciate the mythos mm -hmm. and not be so rigid in our overstanding dogmatic and dogmatic yeah. about oh that's just a man you're just making this up how can you look that deep into things and mm -hmm. put these connections together because these connections are very clear to me you know what i'm saying this is a mythos that has come to life these are archetypes we're seeing it play out the evidence is written on the wall that kind of reminds me of uh, what Dr. Phil and Bobby always used to say is that, you know, the creator seeks experience and knowledge through us. You know, people think the creator is benevolent, but maybe, like you said, this dead letter uh, religion is coming to life through us, experience it coming to knowledge itself, and it was just already written as prophecy. It's prophecy. They said that it would during these times. So the fact that it has mm -hmm. and no one is interpreting it leads me to wonder what's wrong with the people. Right. Like, where are the interpreters of the Dakotas? Like, What's the sense of being a Christian in the church if you can't appreciate the times that you're in? Right. And your book speaks specifically to these times. Mm -hmm. So, going back to what you said about um, him being like an antichrist and a demiurge in the world, what do you think the fear of a black and more messiah stems from? Do you think it's a genetic thing, a psychological, a product of social engineering, or maybe something I haven't mentioned? I think it's a little bit of both because. When you have, again, an ecclesiastic, um, or we're living under the Jesus crisis narrative, right? But you have black Christians and you have white Christians. So you have these people who 
can find themselves in this particular book, mm -hmm. right? Almost as the main characters, but then you have another section of people who said that we have brought you this book for your salvation, and they don't have any references of these people being in that book. Mm -hmm. But who exactly is this religion working for? You know what I'm saying? Who does it speak to? So two people can read one book and get two different interpretations from it. But one person knows the truth and one person, you know what I'm saying, is dealing with a fiction or falsehood mm -hmm. or mistruth. And I think that the people that know the quote unquote truth are scared to death that those people that don't know the truth might find out the truth Wake one day. It, yeah. You know what I'm saying? So they have to give you a false image of a Messiah. But these people reading the book that are praying to this false image of the Messiah actually are the ones that are imbued with a messianic force. Mm -hmm. But they can't get to it because they can't see themselves as a right. Messiah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So who did the clan pray to? I ask people this all the time. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. What God would allow, you know, them to be successful in their campaigns against the children of God. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. This shit is perplexing. It's confusing as fuck. Definitely, definitely. So, I think that, of course, based on social engineering, you know, they've switched the goalposts. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, the team is on this <laughs> side is is you know they 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 just got the shit switched all backwards and they playing over there but the people who really know you know what I'm saying why would Hoover use terminology such as you know what I'm saying we're What's trying that? to prevent the rise of a, a black messiah mm -hmm. why would he even put melanated people who he looks down upon in that context of sanctity of a religion they're supposed to hold in the regards and the ways in which to say, look, again, that this is a quote-unquote Christian country, which it is not. You feel me? Mm -hmm. But again, put the goalpost so close to the people that they, but they still can't see, see it. it right. And then move it every which way, every chance they get. Mm -hmm. And then perform killing of king sacrifices, you know what I'm saying, mm -hmm. on world stages, mm -hmm. on four fours. Right. You know what I'm saying? So the killing of the king or the killing of, you know, the messianic sacrificial, sacrificial rituals that we've seen take place, you know, again, are part of social engineering as well mm -hmm. to move the post further and further and further and further away. Mm -hmm. Because like King Herod did during times of Jesus, you know, they would kill all the firstborns. Mm -hmm. And this was to psychologically, like you said, implant the fear within the wombs of the mothers to say, don't have no more of them sons or they're going to die. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? So how does that even work today? The majority of the children that we see male born, right? Mm -hmm. They say that they're being born to mothers who are um, in fear. And the emphasis is, you know, we don't want you to have a revolutionary spirit. So they're being born and they're very effeminate. And, you know, the, the, the women are worried or concerned for their safety. And we constantly are seeing this narrative playing over and over and over again on TV. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Generation after generation after generation after generation. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To a point where they're like, we don't no longer even have to hunt out the quote unquote black messiah anymore. Because they're going to be exterminated by their own mothers. Castrated mentally. Castrated mentally. So keeping that idea in mind, um, you know, the universe always seeks balance. And uh, a lot of people would say it is the white male who has put us in this current paradigm or whatever, and they're not happy with it. But kind of going back to what you were saying with the feminization of the black male, if it's the white male that has put us in this current paradigm, what would be the opposite of it to balance it? It would be the black woman. So how does that contribute to the messianistic energy? Is it possible that maybe people are looking at it from the masculine and not considering that it is the black woman that's the messiah? I mean, any messianic force would have to pass through her. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's the concept, yes, that I use all the time. Like, even when we used to talk, let, let's go to a messianic force that we can identify in society, Tupac Shakur, right? Who has an aspect of that messianic force that we're talking about. And again, family, we're talking archetypes. Do not get in your feelings and start telling me about his rape charge and, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, uh, 
Uh, his 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 song. What was it? <laughs> I get down and all that. I, I don't want to. Yeah, I get around. I don't want to hear all that. We're talking about archetypes. You know what I'm saying? Um, this brother was born. Um, you know, his mother named him Tupac Shakur, Tupac Amaru Shakur, after the Inking uh, King mm -hmm. or the Shining Serpent or Shining Prince, for that matter. You know. But why why don't we ever take a look at a fiend mm -hmm. and be like, well, goddamn, right. if he was the messiah, if he was a messianic force, if he was the shining prince, who was she? Right. Because look what she had to go through. She was a legend before she even had him. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So she gave birth to this legend, but we don't ever hail the mother up. Right. And that's the issue in society. As much as we want to talk about messianic forces, as much as we want to talk about black messiahs, as much as we want to talk about this, as much as we want to talk about that, as much as they want to argue about, you know, um, painting Jesus black, nobody ever understands that globally, you know what I'm saying, the sanctity of Jesus is really hinged upon Virgin Mary. Right. Okay? It's really hinged upon Virgin Mary, and that has never been challenged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They've come forth for pictures and they like, look, the Pope prays to a black Madonna. Mm -hmm. But nigga, when you hear Madonna, the first thing you see is like a virgin. Mm -hmm. Okay. And like I said, when you go around the world, you know, Virgin Mary is still edified and held up in a particular place where, you know, she's still making appearances with people who's popping up on toast and shit like that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And that that's not being challenged. So... <clears throat> Once again, because of the religious onslaught or the war against women, which is the oldest war on the planet, mm -hmm. the black women in particular, you know, the melanated women for that matter, um, that has never been restored. You know what I'm saying? We, we've we never really corrected, you know, that travesty. It's still going on. Yeah. You know, so she she will never be looked upon in this society as a messiah, as a messianic force. Mm -hmm. But the Messiah has to pass through her. Even in the mythos through a virgin birth, it has to pass through the woman. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So why is she not held up? You know, how can she give birth to a God and not be, you know what I'm saying, like the product of that herself right. or, or, or more powerful? And it's funny you said because, um, you know, going through this process, I've been tapping into my own Messianistic energy. And initially, you know, studying people I like to aspire, Shiva, Dionysus, and all that type of stuff. But it wasn't until I got into the Mami Wata energy that it was like, yo, this is what it really is. You know what I'm saying? When I latched on to that feminine energy, not in an effeminate type of way either, but I was initiated into it. I started to understand it was like it brought out the things that I envisioned the Messiah being, you know, protective, willing to die for something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm trying to yeah, say? Yeah, so yeah. You got to protect her and you have to be willing to die. You know what I'm saying? And then I think that that's when it will unlock the the true keys. You know what I'm saying? Keys. Because even, yeah, you know, with with, with the mythos with, with, with Christ, mm -hmm. you know, his relationship with Mary Magdalene, you know, that was key. That was central to his mission. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That 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 kind of, you know, unfolded everything. So we we if we're going to look at the mythos, if we're going to enact it, if we're going to look for it in society yes we have to see it in its full totality for what it is she has to be the activating principle mm -hmm. behind that messianic force you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. like the memes are popping up with the dark hermit on the shoulder <laughs> you know what i'm saying no it's the woman that's really you know me behind whispering that's like uh, you feel me so to what did they say it was my eye was whispering to hootie's ear uh it's a shot like the brother yeah, yeah. um KT was laying out in the lecture, you know, that that would be his cohort. So, yeah, I mean, I I I definitely um, embrace the idea of it being more of a union. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that the woman by herself is the messianic force. No more than I think that the man by himself. Mm -hmm. It's a messianic force. I think that it's the merger of the conscious and the subconscious creating the superconscious. Gotcha. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's the collective Christ consciousness that we're talking about in this Aquarian age mm -hmm. that is ushering in 
You feel me? Definitely. So yeah, you know, we 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 are seeing a lot more people that we would consider to be spiritual or righteous. They're they're like a little bit more feminine or more in contact with that feminine aspect of them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it permeates in different ways be a balance and i think that even in this community quote unquote conscious community we're still looking for that balance within the community as well definitely you know what i'm saying it's a little bit off because there hasn't been that embracing that merger of the conscious and the subconscious the male and the female to bring about the super conscious and that's where the real messianic christ consciousness lays got you as we're talking about this i noticed you used the um the Jesus Christ narrative, you know, because that's what we're familiar with. But, um, you know, a lot of people say that Jesus Christ narrative is indigenous to Africa and really all messianistic energies are indigenous to, you know, the melanated people of the earth. But there's this notion that uh, Jesus is a Judeo Christian. And then there's also a lot of African messianistic energies that people are unfamiliar with based off of your research and experience. What would you say is the difference between, you know, what the Judeo-Christian Messiah is and what you've researched in the African Messiah, you know, the psychology that have birthed both? What's the difference that you've seen? I mean, anything that we come across, like I said, with, from a Judeo-Christian aspect is going to deal with a suppression of feminine input or the principles in which they've played, you know what I'm saying? So with the Judeo aspect of things or the Christian aspect of things, we definitely see a downplaying of both Marys, mm -hmm. you know, irregardless of the depiction of them, just the downplaying of their importance, you know, um, you know, it, 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 they just totally remove, you know what I'm saying? The feminine aspect period from these books, um, whereas I think that more so if we look at the comedic aspect or the comedic telling of the story, she's a central figure, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of different female deities that are playing key roles in these stories. And we don't see that in the Judeo-Christian uh, mythos at all. Moving into the next question, um... As one studies mythology more and more concerning the archetype of the Messiah, they often see the driving force of a paternal energy that inspires the Messiah. Uh, on a personal note, as fate will have it, uh, today marks the two-year anniversary of my father's transition, you know, passion from the flesh. Condolences. Yes. Thank you, thank you. Uh, undoubtedly, I wouldn't be here without his influence and the events that transpired when he, uh, you know, transitioned. I wouldn't be sitting here with you having this conversation. What do you feel is important concerning the role of the father in the understanding of the Messiah? And for those who fear a black Messiah, do you think that they're aware of the importance of a father figure? Which is why, you know, like we were saying, they emasculate the male on a multi-level attack. Yeah, absolutely. Um, even Heru, who they say didn't, quote unquote, have a father, he was still propelled to revenge his father so he had to have some sort of connection right. to his father he had to have some understanding of who his father was mm -hmm. this is what the kung fu movie is all about right right you know what i'm saying <laughs> these are what all of the narratives are about mm -hmm. this is what star wars was about right you know what i'm saying this quest to find your father so even with our dealings with the european you know what i'm saying this is our conflict mm -hmm. you feel me abandonment mm-hmm like, my daddy don't love me. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to destroy everything. It's right. what we see in the community right now. Mm -hmm. The youth going against the elders. I don't got no daddies. Right. Fuck all you niggas. I'm burning the house down. Civil war. Civil war. Yeah. So, it's very important, you know, once the father is removed, it's like, then who and what is the guiding principle of the young seed, of the young Heru? You know what I'm saying? Um, even in the Jesus Christ of narrative, you know what I'm saying? Him being born of an immaculate, like, I didn't really get that. Like, what relationship did he have with Joseph then? Was he looking at him like he was bootleg? <laughs> like, what was his relationship? Can somebody tell me? Because I don't really know. Joseph was Fugazi. You feel me? Yeah, he was Fugazi. It's like, I don't, you know what I mean? Like, he was curbing him. He looked at him like a derelict. 
<laughs> he just paid the bills. Like, how was he observing him in regards to having a physical father figure? You know what I'm saying? Or oh, look, my biological didn't bother. So this is my stepfather, as opposed to him not having a daddy. His daddy's in heaven, but he had this clear connection to him. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? As just just like Haru would have to have, you know, a salt. I mean, a set must have imbued him with some of this information, but he still had to channel that energy to Something. go to war against his brother, right? Who he had to know was all powerful because he killed his daddy. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So, again, like I said, it's the same thing we would see in the Kung Fu films. How you got to build your shit up, you know what I'm saying? Because this dude killed your master. Mm-hmm. But you you got to fight the dude to kill your master. Your master ain't even give you all the gems yet. You feel me? And if dude was nicer than your, your master, right. who you pulling from? The Obi-Wan Kenobi shit all over again. Right. So we see this in society. We see it in the mythos. We see it in Hollywood through the movies. We see it in all of the narratives. It's very important that one draws upon that particular energy, whether they're present or not. And I guess the mythos are telling you, you can still tap into it, you know what I mean? Even if it's not physically here. It's still in your DNA, and they're still on the other side, you know, spiritually wise. Mm-hmm. So we have to find ways to create these through ways where we could tap in and access this energy. You know, I'm just concerned that, you know, because of the society that we live in and the way that people are procreating, you know what I'm saying, in the culture that we live in, you know what I'm saying? Shorty might meet a dude in the club. It's a one night stand type of situation. Right. You know, they procreate. She never sees him again. Mm-hmm. You know, so this young man is cut off from his entire patrilineal line. You know, no no father, no grandfather, no uncles, no cut, none of that. You know what I'm saying? He ain't getting none of that. He's just raised by these women. Not understanding that the fear for black or more Messiah is real, so they still hunting him. Right. Whether he's prepared for the war or not. Cause I know it's you know what I mean? Him, yeah. You know, he, he, he might be the one and not even know it. He's a sitting duck. You mm. know what I'm saying? So that's the reality of the situation. Of course, there's going to be exceptions to the rule. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But we're looking at an onslaught, you know, based on those factors that there, there are in. Um, Enough of these adequate situations where men are around raising and training their children to know that the hunt is real. You mm. know what I'm saying? That they gunning for you just because you might be the one. Definitely. You know? That kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, when you were saying you'd be able to draw on that energy from somewhere. And uh, Superman, remember when he went back into the ship and he was able to see the hologram of his father. And, you know, his father was directing him around. He had to. He What would he have been without that? Right, right. Even with his daddy not being there. So that's them saying what? He tapped into his Akashic records. Mm-hmm. He tapped into his DNA. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Pulled it out. Yeah, he pulled it out. Um, so we have to see the physical assassination of the Black Messiah, the MLKs, Malcolm X, R.I.P. to them. But um, less spoken of is the insidious assassination that happens in the box office. Recently, I read a book called A Hero with an African Face, and it spoke of a Niagan Messiah named M. Window. Interestingly, I noticed that uh, the phonetics bore resemblance to the Mace Windu character in Star Wars. Can you elaborate on how this affects the psyche and why someone would desire to go this route instead of a physical assassination? It's almost like what Sun Tzu says, you know, in the art of war is... You know, the best fight fought is the one that you don't have to fight. Right. You know what I'm saying? So if one can cause a psychological defeat, right, Mm -hmm. irrespective of the physical battle, you feel me? Mm -hmm. What's better than that? Because the physical approach is the last result. You know what I'm saying? Mm Mm-hmm. That's the last result. So the psychological aspect of what it is that we see, you know, is is more effective. You know what I'm saying? Silent weapons for quiet wars is what it is that we're bearing witness to. 
So they're able to attack this messianic aspect on so many different fronts without lifting guns and, you know, shooting guns off. and Or you sacrifice one for the sake of millions. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Mm -hmm. Like, people are fearful right now. I see people tense up every time that they see a police cruiser go by. It could happen to me. It could happen to me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They jumping their hands up and shit, and, and police is like, huh. I ain't even sweating. I ain't, you know what I'm saying? Like, what's wrong with you? Shot I'm just shot. Me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. It could be me. So when those type of things happen, you know, that kind of stunts somebody's growth, their messianic growth. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Like I said, if this is an archetypical story and a person is journeying to this particular point in this path, you know, only you can take yourself off it because there's no victims, only volunteers. Right. But you can volunteer to take yourself off for of that path by these external factors appearing, you know, as if um, all the odds are against you or the shit is, you know what I'm saying, uh, it's, it's stacked against you. So it's like, damn, why would I even try? They got tanks, they got planes, they got this, they got that. You know what I mean? And people voluntarily shut themselves down mm -hmm. based on this matrix, false appearance. Appearing real, false evidence appearing real for that matter. So, you know, um, that that that's just a war tactic. That's a Sun Tzu war tactic. Definitely. Um, one rap line that's always stuck out to me is, "You can find the Christ where the lepers and the lambs at." And then uh, Psalms twenty three it speaks on how Jesus walked through the valley of shadow and death. You consistently see the Messiah having navigated his way through the underworld. I know from my own personal journey, you know, I've seen the abyss of society. And other uh, things that go on down there, but it was critical in my develop my psychology going through the underworld and seeing the things that happen there. Why do you feel like the Messiah going through the underworld is such an important part of the archetype and the narrative? Because you have two aspects of messianic force. You have um, the priestly aspect and you have the prophecy, mm -hmm. right? The prophet, you know what I mean? And when it comes to the prophet, you know what I'm saying? Um, cause people, you know, there's certain connotations with priestly and that's more sanctified. You got the white robes on and shit like that. But the prophet, like you said, has to walk amongst the people. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? It has to walk amongst the dredges in the underworld because this is where the prophecy is taking place. You know what I'm saying? This is where one is able to extract in real time, you know, where society is at. You feel me? Mm -hmm. And these are the people that we have to speak to that are able to actually receive this information because, you know, normally those people are the strongest. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, I spent a lot of time when I was in Los Angeles because I lived downtown Los Angeles when I was there for a period of time. I used to go to um, Skid Row a lot. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I, I, had, I had that experience that this was the underbelly, the under of the underworld. And I would be gemmed up you know what i'm saying i used to have my walking stick you know but i would go down there and i would feed them and it would be people like spaced out they was on every drug in the cabinet i guess <laughs> and they would look up to me and they'd be like moses moses and they would have you know all of these religious experiences and you know they they would love me so much that they would offer me a hit of crack <laughs> If we could understand, from where, yeah, from them though, it's yeah, love. that I that's know. that's a love gesture. Yeah. Like, I was gonna hit all this by myself, but here, like, this <laughs> right, is yours, right. right? Like, we don't understand where, where something like that would come from. Some people would take it in a particular way. I didn't take the hit, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? But I understood it. It still for them was a gesture of their giving, of the, of their opening up, of their love, and I think that. For Messiah, for Messianic force, if you're going to be about the people, the people are all inclusive. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can't just say that you're about a segment of the people. You got to be about the people who need the most help. So the prostitutes, the hustlers, the pimps, and all of them, you know what I mean? They need the most help. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes, because they're bearing the elements, okay, they're bearing the elements, Right, they're the closest to the concrete in society. Sometimes those are the strongest people, and the furthest out of the matrix too. And the furthest out of the matrix because they're living off the grid. Right, 
You know what I'm saying? Some of them have broken totally free of the illusion. They're self-sufficient. You know what I'm saying? They know psychology of people better than the fucking, you know, the ones in the towers and the ivory towers with the suits on. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Definitely. Or the ones running the nine to fives. You know, they're the closest to the people because they're in the streets all the time, every day. They know the ins and the outs, mm -hmm. you know? So you would have to be amongst that element to really get an idea of who the people are, what the people need, and where the people are at. It's a it's a weird dynamic, man, because um, you know, after I came through the underworld, you know, with the drugs and all that stuff, I find myself yearning to go back. And people would think like, oh, you want to go back to doing drugs? It's like, no, man, it's a simpler life. Like the people have a better understanding of psychology, like you said, where somebody might be like, yo, take a hit of this crack, and even if you get into the Metaphysics of crack, that's still a sacred offering in itself. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, um, it's a difficult adjustment coming from that, man. But going back to, you know, the rap line I referenced and kind of what you were talking about earlier, you know, Kaepernick being a messiah. Even though he's a messiah, man, I always see this messianistic energy come back to the MC. Rakim, Nas, you know, um, this generation is quote unquote. God's messiah. son, right, the God MC. God's son, why do you think that it always manifests itself so prevalent with these microphones, brother? The word. The word. The word. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The word is everything. You know what I'm saying? Even in a, again, like I said, in a, in a religious ecclesiastic uh, context, when we're talking about a biblical context, you know, first it was the word. So, and the word formed flesh. Mm -hmm. So the word controls flesh. You know what I'm saying? So he who has command over the word, or he who has the mass, who's the master of the ceremony, right? Mm -hmm. Who is controlling the ceremony with the word, he has the power. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So the power, yes, is, is in the microphone. The power is in the MC. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I've often said that, um, you know, emceeing or freestyling, really, the form of freestyling qualifies all seven liberal arts. Oh, yeah. It's the highest form. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> when, when, when one is able to really tap in, you know what I'm saying? That's the master mason. Mm -hmm. That's the person that, 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 that can formulate a thought process out of thin air, out of nowhere, you know, and it could coalesce into, you know, a material thing mm -hmm. you feel me yeah right when we look at the concept of what a metaphor is and kabbalistically what are the four worlds how do you go beyond these four worlds through metaphors mm -hmm. you know what i mean the 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 artist or the rhyme or the rapper is serious mm -hmm. the mc you know what i'm saying e, e equals mc square <laughs> like you know what i mean our mcs are uh uh they're transcendental and they don't even really well i can't say that they don't know it because those that do know it have embraced it and they found power in that yeah. but the 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 station itself you know what i'm saying i don't think that it's explained that way you know krs1 came out with the hip-hop bible mm -hmm. you know that was that was that was a work of art so he Mike knows art too hmm? black dots work too i mean shout out to the dot you know what i'm saying Jeez. black dots work epic you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So there are those amongst us that really understand what the station represents of, of hip hop, you know, this platform, you know. And then, of course, there are those that have, you know, play games with it. You know what I'm saying? And you can still see the strength in them and their word. Right. How it permeates and, 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 and terraforms society. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And some people can't seem to get it back. They got a grip on society, right? Mm -hmm. They might not be the best rappers, but that word got people under a trance, has people under a spell. Definitely, definitely. You feel me? So there's power in the word, period. Whether we can say, yo, that shit hop or not. Hey, look. It moves somebody. It moves somebody. Right. They got people trapped. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So there's power in under that spell, word, yeah. you know? There's a merging of two worlds. You know what I'm saying? Where does music exist? Nobody can identify it. They say two things can exist in one space. Will the word and that music do? You know what I'm saying? 
And where does it come from? Where does it exist? Can you identify it? Nobody can. So music is powerful, man. That reminds me of, uh, I don't know if you remember when we first met each other, you know, we were talking about how the MC is the only person who puts to use all the several living arts. But ironically, you have professors at Harvard, professors at Columbia, Yale, who have PhDs and probably wrote dissertations on the English language. But they can't put it to use like the MC can. You know, the, you, the MC is the only person who understands it. And a true alchemist bends it and makes it something that it's not. But keeping that in mind, it seems like the Messiah and the Word go together. And the thing I notice, the more and more I study this messianistic energy, is a Messiah always has his talisman. Krishna had his flute. Dionysus had his staff. You know, um... The MC has his microphone. Jesus had a sword. Jesus had a sword for me. Right. Which, it, which, which, you know, could mean the sacred word. Or it could be a literal sword dripping in blood. The way I've always looked at it is the Mylon sheath is the sword of the Christ. But um, on a personal level, my talisman has been the psilocybin mushroom. Okay. Um, You know, that may seem a little uncouth to a lot of people, but... <laughs> You know, I was 21, I was agnostic, I had no care for spirituality. And then, uh, you know, I did a psilocybin mushroom going through the underworld. And Ganesha came to me and she said, you'll never be the same after this. And the shit scared me, man. The shit scared me so much because I didn't have no frame of reference for what I experienced, you know what I'm saying? But it left me hungry for more. So that, was the, your, that was your apex awakening moment? Exactly, that was my awakening moment. And, um, that's my baby, you know what I'm saying? She's my feminine energy. I take care of her. You know, we have a, a synchronous relationship or whatever. But a lot of things I want you to touch on breathing that. Can you go into some of your Mount Shasta experiences if you're comfortable with it? And why do you see the Messiah with his talisman? Why is it so, you know, why is it, you know, why does he have to have that to get through uh, the archetype, through the narrative? I was asking myself the same question just the other day. And I was writing a post in my mind that I never got a chance to put out. Mm -hmm. And it was explaining. I went through this whole thing when I came out of the mountains the other day. And I got back to New York. And the energy of New York started permeating through me. Mm -hmm. So I still was purging because I had a peyote experience in the mountains. Mescalito. Right? So I'm, 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 I'm purging. I'm, I'm still getting stuff out. And I wanted to go into this phase about jewelry, you know, about how when I was younger, um, you know, I had, you know, I had BBS diamonds. I used to, you know, everything was about the gold and the jewelry and the diamonds and stuff like that. And how many doors used to open for me, you know what I'm saying? And how I used to move the worlds just based on how I used to put these things together. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't me lashing out against my past, but I was speaking about my receptivity in different communities based on the fact that I changed. So I changed my, I went from polo to starting to wear my own clothes and I was shunned by certain people, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, for not being up to date with what their concepts of me should be. I went from wearing diamonds to wearing now talismans and amulets. Mm -hmm. So... I was thinking about one of my jewelers, Sister Ma Jade, how irregardless of what I was going through, right, mm -hmm. I would be able to come to the sister and she would have a talisman ready for me that spoke exactly to that journey. I was going to ask her to make it for me and it would already be ready. Oh, that's wild. And I'd be like, yo, how did you? She'd be like, it just came to me in a dream. I know that you needed this. You know what I'm saying? So when I came off the mountain... And I went to see her. She had this ready for me. That's you know what I'm saying? Too, yeah. And I wanted something like this because I saw something like this in a vision. Mm -hmm. But it was waiting for me on the table. Mm -hmm. like, and it had the red and the blue and all of that in it. I was like, I need this. <laughs> this is mine. You know what I'm saying? I on the spot. <laughs> yeah. Immediately. I the same thing with, with, you know, so all of the pieces and the talismans that I have from her mark different aspects of my journey. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I was just speaking to myself and formulating the words so I can express it to the world about how important talismans and amulets are, you know what I'm saying, to us on these journeys. Um, because not only are they reminders 
of what it is that we went through, not only are they um, present, you know, the the magic of that particular journey, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? But, um, you know, they also, uh, they geometrize something about us. You know what I'm saying? They connect us to uh, uh, that certain place or that certain thing. And I would imagine if Jesus had a sword or these different deific figures had these talismans, then these were, um, they're transmitting utilities. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? These were their transmitting utilities or these were the things that were external to them that amplified whatever they had to transmit. Mm -hmm. So I was envisioning just like that there was so much energy permeating from this to clear the way. Because when I got into New York, I just felt like I was not so much under attack, but I was susceptible to so much of the energy that was moving through this place because I was clean slate coming right. from the mountain. Mm -hmm. So my experience with the uh, with the mushroom is that it more so removes veils. Right. It's not so much of a hallucinogenic as people say, you know what I'm saying? But it removes the veils and it brings spirit realm directly to you. Right. You know what I mean? And... um. I just think that uh, that's necessary um, for people that are journeying, for mm -hmm. people that want to get to the heart of a thing, you know what I'm saying, and a little bit quicker than it takes, you know, for, uh, let me do say this, and I think I was speaking to our brother Rich about this earlier, you know, processes are necessary Definitely. because there's a lot of learning along those roads you know unfolding is necessary knowledge wisdom understanding all of that you know what i mean but then there's other things that can accelerate that process that are not necessarily what one you know quote unquote bad mm -hmm. you know what i mean sometimes you got to get to where you going and you just got to get there a little bit quicker right you know in my particular um case this retreat was about it was a healing journey mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, um, and it was a vision quest. You know what I'm saying? And I kind of came out of that journey knowing that, especially um, in that setting, because the most magical things that I experienced, I was not able to capture them. Mm -hmm. I pulled my camera out. My camera wouldn't work. <laughs> right. And everyone around me, their camera wouldn't work either. So it's almost like, no, this is for you. Keep, yeah. In this setting, it's not for you to share with the world. If they want this, they got to come up to this mountain. Right. You know what I'm saying? They got to experience this. This right. is not for you to go and put on blast. You know what I mean? So I, I really think that um, it is, it's, uh, it's personal. Definitely. You know what I mean? And, and and it really it helps you appreciate, you know, the personal aspects of what's yours. Just like your talisman and your amulet, I can't get this to nobody else and expect them to do for them right. what is done for me. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? To them it's just gonna be a piece of jewelry. So I was wearing diamonds, that was jewelry. Mm -hmm. You feel me? These are talismans. There's right. a difference. Mm-hmm. And we have to understand what that difference is, you know? So people have been like, damn, son, like, you got them big chains on. Why you just don't go back to the little diamonds? <laughs> As if that would make a difference. Right. Like, those are people that are not appreciative of the journey. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And people always want to hoist on you their image of... <laughs> right. Who you should be, yeah. Because they can't yeah. do it themselves. It's not even so much that they can't do it themselves. That might not be their journey. Like, That's you know what I mean? Everything ain't for everyone. Mm -hmm. If you the one, that means 99% or 99 others are not receptive of what's for you. Because right. you're the one. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Neo didn't have no counterparts. Mm -hmm. Other than they said the, the five or six that came before him that were no longer there. Right. So nobody around him understood what he was going through. Mm -hmm. You feel me? Why should we be expecting everyone around us? And this is the problem that we have. We keep trying to, 
You know? No, definitely, yeah. We, we, we keep trying to have people understand that process. Like, even the whole unfolding of the messianic force, like, that is going to happen to people gradually. When I was young, meaning when I was 14 or 15, I used to add up my birthday, which is 11, 14. I was into numerology at a younger age without knowing necessarily what numerology is. And that voice in my head would always be like, you know what? At 25, you're going to have an enlightening experience. At 25, something's going to take place. It's going to change the course of your life. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I was always knowing. I didn't share that with nobody. Mm -hmm. I kept it to myself. Mm -hmm. And even when I least expected it, it happened. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even when I was 25, I wasn't moving through 25 looking for it. Right, right. You feel me? I was non-conscious of it. Subconsciously, I was aware. But consciously, I wasn't. And then I experienced it. Mm -hmm. And it changed the course of my life. You feel me? Crazy. Just a quick thought, man. Um, when I came out here, my grandfather passed. But I bet felt his energy. And then as you was talking, I was literally thinking about him. And his birthday is November 15th. So it's crazy you said that. Whatever. Okay. Indeed. But peace Shout down. out to my Scorpion brother. Right, right, right. Yeah, he's with us. Yeah, definitely, man. Uh, with that said, that's pretty much the conclusion of what I wanted to cover in this. Um, the last tidbit, and I'll leave it open too if you want to say anything, is um, I got this from Brother A. Rashid when I was one of his students. Is, uh, the reason people die is a lack of appreciation. So, man to man, brother to brother, I want to let you know I appreciate what you know you and your brother are doing. Uh, brother A. A. Rashid for presenting the idea. Um, my mentor, Adika Butler, Brother Rich for letting me use his camera, and to everybody in the universe. So, anything you want indeed, to add on to that, indeed. man? Indeed. Um, I, the law of 44, you know, is a vehicle that really speaks to your inquiries in regards to messiahs and messianic forces. You know, what I've been able to learn through this research in regards to, again, like I said, the permeating narrative of, of our time, of the society, the Jesus Christ of narrative, mm -hmm. you know, and the way that it was coded and rooted in 44. Like I said, I told him at the lecture, I tell people here, Galatians 4.4, 4, 4, you know what I'm saying? Look it up. And there's numerous, you know, there was 44 prophecies or, or that Jesus came and fulfilled. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's so many 44s. And this book was written by a man named Paul. Mm. Let's be clear about what the Bible is. Paul Moreland. You know what I'm saying? So, understanding these things. And I read a book when I was a child. And when I say a child, I don't mean like 14 or 15. I was younger. I was probably in my 20s, late 20s, and I was on my journey getting this information. And the book was called Harem Key, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> and I was reading this book called Harem Key, and these were these masons that broke away from the lodge and started telling all the secrets. And they was like, look, man, we're going to tell this shit. It might cost us our lives. And I knew about blinds. Like, Rashid used to tell me about blinds. He was like, look. You can't trust this. You can't trust that because they're going to throw blinds out. You know what I'm saying? But this book spoke to me in a particular way because a good friend of mine who was in the lodge passed it to me. He didn't say nothing. He was just like, you need to read this. Hmm. And I read it, and it was talking about Jesus. And it said that um, so Jesus had a twin. Hmm. And that's what the book of St. Thomas was about. And it said his twin's name was Philip. You know? And it said that... um. You know, um, they they just was going into it. Like, they said that the G's were interchangeable with P's. Cause, I mean, uh, the J's were interchangeable with P's because the J's wasn't existing at that time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they was like, Philip. Then they said it was St. Thomas. My brother's name was Philip Thomas. Mm -hmm. You know, then they was going into the whole Judas aspect of that. I was, so I was just like, whoa. Right. You know what I mean? Like, what the fuck is going on? But it developed my psychology as a as a youngster to say, well, what if? To be receptive to the... To be receptive yeah. to the what if. And I just used to move through life like that. I'm like, either I'm Jesus or Judas. <laughs> right. You feel me? Jesus wouldn't have been Jesus without Judas. It's one and the same once you step It's, it's one and the same. So really I understood the whole twin aspect, the brother aspect of that energy, of that dynamic. 
And mind you, like I said, I never deviated from reading it as a mythos. Mm -hmm. But then I came into the Hero Twins. I came into all of these different stories through through times, all these different mythologies that was dealing with this twin messianic force. You feel me? Mm -hmm. So that psychologically prepared me for my journey. Okay? Mm -hmm. I started writing a book of poetry. I got incarcerated on a hum in 2007. Right? And um, I wasn't supposed to. It was February 21st. I normally don't even go outside that day because that's the day that Malcolm X was assassinated. I celebrate it like a holy day. Mm -hmm. I went outside. Something happened. I'm not going to get into, you know what I mean? They ran my name. I was I was stopped. They ran my name and I had a warrant. Mm -hmm. I don't know from where. They said it was from Westchester. I had a case in Westchester a while ago. You know what I'm saying? That I swore had been closed. Because I had gone through these two trials in 2000 and 2001 that was crazy. Mm -hmm. That I, you know, when I initially came into my moral science and... These are the trials that started changing my life because I really started seeing my powers. You know what I mean? I used everything at my disposal to keep these beasts off my back. So I'm like, if I had a warrant, why well, that shit ain't pop up during then? But whatever reason this shit popped up, they sent me to Valhalla in Westchester. I was in bed 16. I didn't know that the brother in bed 7 was Malcolm X's grandson. You know what I'm saying? So, mind you, like I said, I got knocked on the 21st. I'm in bed 16. He's in bed 7. Hmm. Right? So, I started writing my book. I started writing a book of poetry when I was there. Because I just came from a few days prior to that. I, I came from seeing Hypnotic Brass Ensemble performing with Most Def at BAM. Mm -hmm. Now, Hypnotics, that's my mans in them. Most, that's my mans in them. Mm -hmm. So I used to always be like, yo, I'm writing these rhymes and shit like that, but I don't want to make no fucking rap album. I'm not no rapper. <laughs> I was like, I want to see what poetry would sound like in rhyme format with live instrumentation. So most of that was doing covers of rappers, famous, like he was doing big covers and shit like that, but Hypnotic was backing them up as live musicians mm -hmm. so i had the the archetype the prototype in my mind for how this would sound mm -hmm. so i started writing you know entire pieces you know what i'm saying still with the music playing in my mind and i started sharing it with some of the um people in the unit and shit they was blown away wow. they was like yo son i'm gonna stop selling drugs when i come home i'm gonna put this money in the studio you gotta record that like they was in i brought some people to tears like i was yeah. going in you feel me I named that book The Blue Pill, mm -hmm. right? The Book of Poetry. I named the Book of Poetry The Blue Pill. You know what I'm saying? I had my confrontation while I was in there with Malcolm X grandson. I cornered him because he was a, a blood superior, quote-unquote blood superior mm -hmm. in that unit. And I used to sit back and look at homie like, this is Malcolm Shabazz, right? Peace and blessings be upon him. May, peace, he, peace. may he rest in peace. And I'd be like, yo, like, this is not him. Like, this is not his life. Mm -hmm. He's really not about that. You know what I'm saying? He looks crazy. And I'm just sitting back looking at him. And one day I caught him by himself. And I, I leaned in for two hours and poured everything I had in me into his soul. Like, just like, my dude, do you know who your grandfather is? Mm -hmm. And he was like, I just found out. <laughs> I never knew. He's like, I never knew. He's like, wow. my, my parents and my, they, they kept it from me. First of all, they told me that was my father. And, you know, they just didn't share his history with me. They gave me a, a different history. He's like, when I got up north, the old timers told me who my grandfather was. I'm like, mm -hmm. God damn. Right. They set you up like that? Mm -hmm. He was like, yeah. They was trying to keep me from it. Because there was a prophecy about the seventh son. So Malcolm had six daughters. He never had any sons. He was be, be considered the seventh, seventh son. son. Right, right. So they was trying to keep him from the prophecy that he had to fulfill. I told him everything I had. I told him about the Moors. I told him about, you know, your, your, your grandfather was about human rights, not civil rights. And this is the continuation of it. This is the fight that's being fought in the streets right now in terms of human rights, dealing with this information. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I, I gave him as much as anything that I could give him. I gave him. 
Next thing you know, it was my time to leave. They called me. I was gone. Like a few days yeah. after that. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? My time was, was up. Mm-hmm. What I had came there to do, I had already done. So I come home. So he was like, yo, please give um, my information to most deaf. Mm-hmm. You feel me? Because he was telling me about how many dudes he had met in the industry that was telling, I'm going to keep it real with you. And, you know, I'm a holler unit. And nobody ever kept it real with him. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I was like, yo, I can make sure most deaf gets this information. And I know he's going to holler at you. Mm-hmm. So he wrote the information down on the back of the book. I took the book home. Boom. Right? Come to find out, I seen most deaf like the first week I came home. I went to get a pizza. Right? On West 4th, the best pizza shop right by that train station. He's right over there. You know what I mean? I'm like, yo, son, I told him the whole story and what have you. He's like, I need that information. All right? So I made a copy of, because I also was like, yo, I need you to also, you know what I mean? Check this book out. Yeah, I, yeah. I laid this shit down. Like, and I, it was inspired by you and Hypnotic. Mm-hmm. So I made a copy of the book that had all the information in it. Passed him a copy. I brings the book out with me. Right? Now I'm bending on 125th Street in front of the Apollo. There was a brother out there named Brother Amun who used to always come across the street, right? Sarnetta was across the street. Amun used to come across the street just to hear this poetry that I had. Mm-hmm. I would share pieces with him and shit. My um, business partner at the time, he used to be hating and shit, right? Yo, son, we out here hustling. This ain't a motherfucking performance. I'm like, chill, man. Like, this nigga appreciates my work. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm gonna share this work. Right, right. You know what I mean? This shit heartfelt. I know what it did in the fucking pen. Like, you know, I need to get this out. Gotta let the light shine. Yeah, I gotta let it out. Right, right. So I used to go in, go in. So I'm used to be the one to be like, yo, son, yo, side, I need you to hear the blue pill. <laughs> he was talking about the book, not me being the blue pill. The book was called a blue pill. Mm-hmm. So Sarnetta started be like, yo, blue pill, blue pill, blue pill. And I think he went on video a few times and said, and I used to be pissed, like, yo, my name is P. Moore, mm-hmm. right? Show for P. Morpheus. I used to pull people out of the Matrix, right, right? right? I'm like, yo, not the blue pill. I meant to name it the red pill, mm-hmm. meaning the pill that gets you out of the Matrix. Yeah. I, I named it the wrong way. You got it backwards. And look, somebody <laughs> had wrote graffiti on the cover, and the shit was so cold. Mm-hmm. I was like, ain't no way. I'm, I'm like, I'm publishing this shit just like that. Homie did an ill piece. Mm -hmm. I was like, I can't violate that. I'm just going to, for some reason, this is supposed to be called a blue pill. You know what I mean? Even if I got it wrong, I'm going to stick with it. Like, fuck that. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because I'm like, I don't want people running to something that they think is their shit just because it got a name on it. The people that's going to be able to find this book have to really be looking for it because it's the pill that you ain't supposed to take. Right. I'm going to do the 52 fake out. And I said that nigga Neo did not even complete his job in the Matrix. He took the red pill, but he still had to renegotiate his contract at the end with that machine. Right. I was like, the, the, the red pill ain't. The nigga has still had to come into the Matrix. You feel me? Mm-hmm. And he ain't motherfucking completed. He renegotiated the contract. So I was like, I'm going to stick with this blue pill shit. And that's how I came about with the name, mm-hmm. the blue pill. You know what I mean? So, I'm saying all that to say, um, like, the the journey, you feel me? Like, even your mistakes end up being the things that vindicate or speak directly to who you are. Because when I go back and I look at my baby pictures, I had on the blue, my brother had on the red. You know what I'm saying? That's more resonating with my colors more so than his. I'm Pluto. He's more Mars. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, so many things are from, like, KT was showing you with the, the ultraviolet lights and, the, and, you know what I mean? Like, all of these things that permeate, like, you you never really know what it is. And like I said, all of these things spoke to my my developmental psychology of who I am and how I was going to play this mythos out. You feel me? So I am you. the blue pill because I'm living in my dream. Right. You know what I'm saying? I am living in my dream. And P. Morpheus, or when you talk about Morpheus, you know, that's the Lord of Dreams. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Who governs over dope and heroin. I'm not a dope dealer. I never took dope or nothing like that. But, um, you know, 
later on in life it, it helped me factor into it even understanding the law of 44 and how that coincided with hope and hope is an opiate like dope and this that, and the other and ray 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 i'm just saying that you know for the family that wants to unravel their mythos or their part that they're playing in this narrative mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying they really got to find themselves because the law of 44 and, and everything else that came along with it, it, it really um, is fucking amazing. Like, you know what I mean? I freestyled my way into that shit. Like, Some amazing you know? shit, man. Like, you know, this is the first time you would ever talk like this. And to bear witness to what you're saying, you talked about how the Malcolm X was integral in becoming who you are. You know, me and his grandson. The school I go to right now used to be a prison. And it's where Malcolm Little became Malcolm X. Couldn't write that shit, man. You know what I'm saying? You know, I live in Boston or whatever, so it's in Boston. Yeah. Man, I, I visited his house when I went out there. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, this shit got me in tears because it's like, the story is crazy, bro. Yeah, man. It's real. And, and you can't make it up. You can't. You know what I'm saying? You can't make it up. And I've just, I've just lived, I've just let it live. You know what I'm saying? I've let it unravel and play itself accordingly and it's still unraveling and, and, and all of the pieces are still coming into fruition and I just feel that we're here playing a, a necessary part you know like you said like I mean like I was saying earlier uh, these pages are coming to life mm -hmm. in real time That's you real. know what I'm saying and we just should be appreciative of the journey we should just let things you know what I'm saying Just let it play out. You know, time is not linear. It's centrifugal. So in many regards, we've already been here. We've already done this. It was already written. You know Indeed. what I'm saying? Indeed. And shout out to Brother Rich. This brother has been instrumental in my journey. Appreciate it. I'm going to tell a Brother Rich story before we leave. Or that's all I got for the people, brother. Oh, look. I got to tell all a Brother Rich story. Ahead, you know what I'm saying? Because this was an integral <laughs> part, you know, as well. And I was reminded about it. The other day Because I started Going in my bag You know I, I woke up to a comment That almost fucked my day up On our latest video Brother was like All the pills do is talk What the <laughs> hell You ever done <laughs> He was talking about Rich or Nah Somebody in the comment section On one of the videos He was talking about us Right mm -hmm. He's like All the pills ever do is talk mm -hmm. What the hell Y'all niggas ever done I was like What Mm -hmm. So I was like I, 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 It reminded me that I found myself In this position before Because Brother Rich had, He was he used to sell DVDs downtown Right And he had commissioned me To do a stand up poster for him That he wanted to put on the sides Of his DVD um, uh, uh, Table Table right, right, right. To, 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 to pull in customers So the brother told me what he wanted and shit, you know what I'm saying? And I took mad long to deliver. Mm -hmm. And I remember one time I, I I had went and seen him. He was downtown. And the brother just let me just. <laughs> <laughs> so then he was like. Nah, 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 nah. Who the fuck are you? What the fuck y'all ever done in the community? <laughs> Mind you, I helped create this shit. Right. But I had never, you know, I was non vocal about it. Mm -hmm. I faded to black. And then the people that was at the forefront, I almost say that they was taking all the credit, but they wasn't mentioning me. Right. You know what I'm saying? So it kind of appeared like I was just a hanger on, like an onlooker and shit like that. So I was like, oh shit, like nobody really knows what I've done. Mm -hmm. And it, it forced me to tell my story. You know what I'm saying? So I'm an introvert more so in, in, in the twin dynamic. Like, I'll be quiet. I just observe, right? I listen and I observe more so than anything. My brother's a lot more vocal out front. So I'm like, damn, but at the detriment. If you type before, after, way after, it's the first image that comes up on Google. Yeah. First image. Right? Mm -hmm. So the brother propelled me into greatness based on him putting that fire underneath me. So... What came out of it is a very famous image 
this all over the internet, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's called the before, after, and way after image, where I show uh, Orset and her and and and, and Heru, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And then the the Black Madonna with the Black Christ, and then you have Virgin Mary oh, with yeah, the White yeah, Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I created that. Oh, word. Yeah. Word. And I ain't get no credit for that. With <laughs> <laughs> the same but, concept. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it we even here, full circle, and I talking about this messianic force, like we we've contributed in a way in which that shit has woken so many people up just through the imagery. This was before the internet. Right, right. This is before things were going viral and digital and stuff like that. That's crazy, man. I'm still thinking about that picture and like yeah. how far it's gotten. How around. far it's gotten. It's not tagged. My name ain't on it. It's not, you know what I'm saying? It's not about that. Mm-hmm. It's about the work and, and kind of the things that's necessary to push you and propel you forward to your greatness. You know, we made history together before we was even technically. That was our first work together. I, I, I was su- I suspect, and it's iconic. Word. You feel me? Mm-hmm. And we don't even talk about it because we've done so many things afterwards mm-hmm. that have physical, real effects in this fucking world. Tangible results. Tangible results. Yeah. And, I, and I'm that's even irrespective of my resume outside of that mm-hmm. so i'm here trying to explain myself to the yo i did to the, and i was like i sound stupid like you gotta catch yourself yeah just just get into your bag like create a new file like you know what i'm saying and, and i've just been recreating and re, recreating myself over and over and i was telling like i said i was going in my bag on instagram that was only from 1991 to 94 i didn't even get past that yet and that shit was so iconic that it had people you know what I mean? Inspired in all types of different ways. Like, I've lived mad different lives in one lifetime. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I've been, I got mad different names in those lives and mad different groups of people who've been inspired and have followed that particular journey. These are the unravelings, like I said, of this mythos. And it's ongoing and it's ongoing. Now I've attached myself to a number that will be immortalized. You know what I'm saying? But... I don't even think, like I said, there's still something bigger. You know what I'm saying? There's still more to go. Definitely. You feel me? I'm always the child. I'll always be that child who, at the age of like five and six, used to tell my mother, like, yo, I came to change the world. Mm-hmm. And she was like, what's wrong with you? No, I know exactly what you're coming like, from, man. I'm like, nothing. And then she cured AIDS and she don't even get it. Mm-hmm. She downplays. She don't even, she's not even vocal about that. She was the first one, not Dr. Sabi. Mm-hmm. And, you know, so I come from that. You know what I mean? That people have done my, I'm like, how can you outdo that? You know what I'm saying? And I'm not trying to. I'm just, I just want to fulfill my mandate in regards to saying, yo, we have a lot of greatness that are untapped in us. And if we just dare to dig, Certainly. the shit that we come up with would be so monumental that we can write. The mythos of our age should bring you to tears, man. I'm I'm teared out at this yeah. particular point. You know the way that it happens. You know you just gotta bear witness to your own story, and there are messiahs out there that I'm speaking to that you know that are known or unknown that know it about themselves that don't know it about themselves. You know what I'm saying? Y'all are there, so just dig a little bit deeper. And bring your greatness to the forefront because the world awaits you and the world will definitely be a better place with you on your throne. Thanks. Peace. Peace, love, and light. Not on your cross, though. <laughs> All right? <laughs> peace, peace, family. This is Brother Rich from UGR. Urging all my viewers and subscribers to help support the channel by donating just $1 to the UGR PayPal account. We appreciate the viewership and support, and we understand the power of a dollar. If you benefit in any way, shape, or form, we ask that you donate a dollar, whether it be monthly, bi-monthly, quarterly, or yearly, so that we can build our brand to compete with the NBCs, the MTVs, and the Foxes of the world. I figure since Kanye can ask Mark Zuckerberg for $1 billion, I can ask my subscribers to donate $1 so I can make the best possible content possible. 
the main objective of this channel is to inspire you to become the greatest version of yourself. So hopefully throughout the years of you watching this program, you have been inspired to become the greatest version of yourself. If you would like to donate, you could go to www.paypal.com and send a donation to richandmerit7 at yahoo.com. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your program. I'm on 100%, 100 Red and blue, purple like Prince. Prince Red and blue, purple the Benz. Benz Change up the circle of friends Change it. The nether will circle the twins Circles. 75 ever since Since 70 wives in the fence Prince. Red and blue, purple like Prince. Prince Red and blue, purple like Prince Red and blue, purple like Prince. Prince. 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 We feeling the urge, killing the purge. Buzz is electric. We feeling the surge, feeling the words, killing the birds with immunity. Pillars of unity. This is the form of the Voltron. This is the age of the Ultron. This is same stage as the Pope bomb. This is the sage you can smoke on. Copper pound, came on the scene, I was copper down All I was missing was copper crown Summer 16, I turned copper brown Look for revenge in the copper town Capping the jersey and copper crown 21 guns to lose jumper sound My power pieces, the crystals be talking The cloth that be talking King County clothing, yeah, king of New York And I'm Christopher Walken, the missiles and bo-